Welcome back to the highly unanticipated, very unprofessional, and extremely boring podcast you always knew you didn't need, Learning Lutheran, where we are learning the distinctives of the Lutheran faith. It's been about a month since the last time I've uploaded anything. I've been... A lot busier than I was expecting. Some foster care stuff. uh, Doctor's appointments. Everybody getting sick. But trying to record this and get this one out to at least have one episode come out in February of 2023. Um, I started reading... Lutheranism 101, the Lord's Supper take, and I'm about halfway through on it right now, really enjoying it. It's at a very layman level. It's easy to understand, but still not dumbing it down. Um one of the elders from the church, he's going to come on and we're going to walk through Lutheran liturgy and try to explain it in a way that'll be able to be understood by someone who's never stepped foot inside a Lutheran church before because my preconceived ideas of what a Lutheran service was like wound up being 100% wrong when I actually stepped foot inside. And today we're going to be talking about the Proto-Evangelium, which is Genesis chapters 3, verse 14 and 15. And it's essentially just the first proclamation of the gospel. And then going from there, the next episode, I plan on going more in depth in the gospel, why it's important, why we get it right, and the distinction between law and gospel that'll come in the the following episode but today i want to focus just on the proto evangelium and that just simply means the first gospel it's the first time that the gospel was proclaimed and it pointed to christ's victory on the cross So Genesis chapter 3 verse 14 says, The Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. And I'll be coming at this text and Genesis, and really the whole Bible, is as legitimate history. Not fables, not myths, but Adam and Eve were created, it actually happened, and they actually encountered the devil as the serpent. 
I don't think any of this was made up to be moralistic, but that's the presupposition I'll be handling this as, as history. And for some background for our text to show this proto-evangelium, we need to look back in chapter 2, verse 16 and 17 real quick. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in that day you eat of it, you shall surely die. And we see at the beginning of chapter 3 where Adam and Eve are tempted by Satan as the serpent. And when Satan tempts Eve, he twist God's word. He puts a doubt in Eve's ears stating, did God actually say? And then he doesn't quote God correctly. He puts his own spin on it. Did God actually say, you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? But we see from in chapter 2 of what I had just read, that's not what God had actually said. But Eve fell for the temptation, and then she even adds words to God's mouth, saying that they couldn't even touch it or they would die. And God did state that the day they ate of it, they would die. And we'll get into that towards more of the end of the episode. But that seed of doubt had been planted, and the questioning of God's word had started. And I don't see anything wrong with actually asking questions or trying to actually figure out what you believe. But when we start actually doubting God's word, like that's the problem, not not us working through it, but when we doubt it. And so God goes on to question Adam and Eve, and he he starts with Adam. And Adam, in turn, even goes as far as blaming God himself by saying, the woman that you gave me. So we start at the the fall, we start shifting blame, not taking responsibility for our own actions. There was no sign of repentance in that moment, but just blame shifting. Adam moves it to Eve and still takes that step further and says that she's the woman that you gave me, Lord. And then uh, Eve I mean, in return, shifts the blame onto the serpent. And that's where our we pick up in our text that I read at the beginning. And there was a, a text in verse 14 that I never really knew what it meant until checking the the footnotes and in the the footnote it's it directs us to Micah chapter 7 and um like what i never understood was the part where 
God says that you will eat dust all the days of your life. But in Micah 7, starting in verse 16, it says, The nations shall see and be ashamed of all their might. They shall lay their hands on their mouths. Their ears shall be deaf. They shall lick the dust like a serpent. Like the crawling things of the earth, they shall come trembling out of their strongholds. They shall turn in dread to the Lord our God, and they shall be in fear of you. And this was basically in verse 14 of Genesis 3 saying that the serpent Satan was going to have humiliation and defeat. The the dust wasn't going to provide any nutritional value and actually be food for him, but was just a metaphor of sorts of humiliation. And in verse 15, we get that proto evangelium that first proclamation of the gospel i will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel for thousands of years the offspring of both Adam and Eve and then the serpent would be at war with each other. And someone would rise up who would be a type of Christ, but not the Christ himself. But that person would rise up, but then ultimately fail, giving the illusion that the serpent was winning. And this happened over and over until the Virgin Mary gave birth to the Christ, Jesus. He lived that perfect, sinless life that none who had come before him could, nor who would come after could. He went to that cross, bloodied, beaten, bruised and then he died on that cross but that death was merely a bruise because three days later he would conquer death and be resurrected and in doing so he crushed the serpent's Head. He won that victory for us. He was that penal substitution. He gave his righteousness to us, took our place on the cross, and crowned us with righteousness. And going back to when God said, For in that day that you eat of it, you will surely die. God isn't a liar. So death had to happen. A physical death had to happen then. But at the same time as being just and holy, he's also loving. And he provides that way out for us in chapter 3 verse 15 we catch that glimpse of how he's going to do that in the future but something still had to take place then and we'll see in the at the end of chapter 3 of what that was, what 
pointed to Christ that was that type and shadow. And in verse 20, it says, The man called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. So we see that Adam's already trusting God because he names her Eve, the mother of all living, when she has yet to bear him any offspring. And then in verse 21, And the Lord God made for Adam and for his wife garments of skin and clothed them. Satan tried to tell them that they wouldn't die by eating of the fruit. He was trying to show that God was a liar, that death wouldn't happen. And death hadn't happened up to this point. And I had been taught my whole life that it was only a spiritual death that happened. I still believe that there was that spiritual death, that separation between God and man, that fellowship was no longer there. But God is not a liar. He is just. He is holy. And he said, the day you eat of it, you will die. So a physical death had to take place. But God is also a loving God. We saw in verse 15 that proto-evangelium, the first proclamation of the gospel. And in it, laid humanity's hope and salvation. And in verse 20 of the same chapter, we see the physical death happening when he took that animal's skin to make the clothing for Adam and Eve. We don't know what animal that was, I tend to speculate it was a lamb, but since we are not told, I don't actually know. But he took the skin of that animal, and that was the first sacrifice, the first shadow and type that points to Christ's sacrifice in the future. And he places the skin of that animal on Adam and Eve the same way that in Christ's sacrifice Jesus' righteousness is placed on us. Our sin is placed on Jesus and we are given his righteousness the same way that the sin of Adam and Eve eating from that tree was placed on that animal. Death did occur that day. There was no lie. Death, a physical death, did happen. So God was proved to be true, righteous, holy, and loving. And this is not something that we can achieve for ourselves. The law is good, but it cannot save us. It will point us to Christ, but it itself will not save us. The law and the gospel must not be confused. And in the next episode, 
I will go more into the law and gospel distinction and break it down even further. But thank you again for joining me. This was just something I threw together on a whim to try to get something out this month. And also I want to remind that I am not a leader in a church. I'm not trying to be a leader. I'm simply just a layman trying to work out the Lutheran doctrines. But if anything I say is wrong, heretical, my in contact information is in the show notes and my church's contact information is in the show notes. But thank you again for tuning in and I will see you next time. The Lord be with you.